Music in Dutch, and um, I learned a lot by him. It was a very conscious decision for me to go and study with him for very specific reasons. Since I'm Greek, I know how to master melodies by nature. Why? Because I grew up with music. Our music is very melodic. I mean, it's the music you hear around you, even in the church, or the songs, or uh, the the folk music, which is. Which is um, is totally different. Uh, it is all based on radical events of what what we call melodies. But it's not about themes. It's not about chopping up the melodies, making things out of them, and then traditional you know, and classical and stuff, and then dealing with them in a different way because you cannot deal with melodies that easily. So of course it's understood that there are forms in the past to develop Variation, we call it, we chop it up in small pieces, and these are called themes, smaller, they are the motifs, whatever. You can see that the melodies were moving freer in medieval music, uh, for example, before they were like radicalized and, and you know, controlled by animals. Which is, I'm not saying it's bad or good, I'm just saying that which was the, 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 the idea or my, my, my ideas that I couldn't even verbalize the way I verbalize it now, back in my early 20s when I decided to. So, um, I always wanted to focus on melodies uh, since I started writing music, which is very weird because in the 80s, uh, when we were starting to come uh, to want to play composer, you would go for complexity, you would go, you know, what's the matter with all these things that are easy and you know, all these heroes, but, but nobody would expect that you, uh, you know, just start loving melodies and then not wanting to deal with the melodies in a way that anybody would know. So how do you let's say deal with that? It's not only deal, you know what you have to do in order not to kill them. Let's put that way. You don't to kill them alive and you want to work seriously on the practical level. And it's not gonna be part of them, it's not gonna be human, it's not gonna be these things. These are just the tools. This is just for me, it's the gym, actually. Like, you go to the gym if you're a dancer, you uh, do counterpoint the food when you're a composer. Because you must be strong to you know, do a little bit. Never slow it up. That doesn't mean you, you will be a composer because you know these things. For me, and I, I'm still saying this to myself, and I will always say this to myself, you are a composer because you want to do something that is really crazy and new, and that new in a way that you haven't heard it. For yourself, not others, but you. So you know what you're saying. So I went to uni, obviously, because um, I knew that I wanted to find harmonies. It's not that I didn't want to find harmonies. I wanted to find harmonies that I had in my imagination, but I did not know how to deal with them. So I went with him, and he actually helped me a lot because his music is um, a mix in both, let's say, uh, levels and the vertical. But also his, the way he was constructing his chords were so much a part of the melody, let's put that way. And I don't want to say melody, I want to say about the, the, the vertical material. So they were so much derived from the vertical material and 
and we are in unity. So I wanted to find the secret to that. What is the secret? And he told me, um, uh, you know, how can you, it's all about poetry, how can you make a voice? It's like a film, of course, in terms of music and not of, um, you know, um, let's say, crystallization. <laughs> further on that, let's say, dream quest of how to make music that will not be like crystallized, like frozen, like um, um, losing kind of life. Um, in all these years uh, uh, of developing my materials, I came up to write a piece called Salto di Sappho, in which piece I um, developed very consciously um, the techniques that I was using before, which were like this, what I say, non-linear way of composing um, and processes of composing. Uh, and why I say it? Because um, I found out that um, the more one direction you go, the more as a composer, or you restrict yourself, or because you become <laughs> a bit uncertain of the events, you start to grip them and to put them into specific orders, and then something is getting lost in my music. So um, I sensed and I've seen that if I left uh, the materials on themselves, that they don't follow a time, a timeline, um, every day, you're working with a material, let's say a sentence or a, or a phrase, a phrase that can be only melodic, a phrase that can have different aspects of harmonies, a phrase that um, develops from from mono, monodic, so one one voice to more voices, then going one to one voice again, these kind of things. And I discovered that um, sorry that the material was. Um, giving birth to itself, but not like this, but like this. So every day I was going for this specific melodic fragment, and this melodic fragment was telling me, I can be here extended, I can be extended here, you can uh, use a fragment of me here. Uh, I think I'm going to stop it now because it gets a bit intense and then I cannot concentrate myself. Um, So this was the first time that I realized I make a kind of cantus firmus, for example, idea that this is kind of skeleton. There is a sentence there, a musical sentence. You will see lots of them in Odysseus, and I can show you also my first first draft, so you can see very clearly what I mean with these skeleton things. And then um, this is not the end, and this is not the end like this, but this is not the end in, in itself. So it's more like hypertonic, and you can say, you start extending the material in the material itself. Every day, things come in different ways of uh, arranging the material in time also arise and come in your, in your technique. And then the result of this effort was quite a very, um, it was a, co a double concert for a pan flute recorder and orchestra and it was performed in the Saturday matinee in, um, at the Concert Cabal in, in Amsterdam. It was in November um, 18, 2018. And um, of course also, also because it is very difficult to write a concert of a band, flute and recorder who is crazy enough to say yes I'm going to do it. 
But they knew the musicians, they're amazing. Uh, Matthijs Koene and Eric Bosgraaf, uh, recorder. And I knew they would make something very spectacular out of it. So, but the question was immediately, so I'm just an introduction. I want to talk about Salto de Sato you also, because it's the beginning of this Odysseus scene, um, kind of beginning, uh, of this uh, realizing this, uh, this technique that I'm doing. And uh, it starts with this problematic uh, thing that you have two high instruments and you have an orchestra and you don't want to have them all the time on the high register and the orchestra underneath as the accompaniment. You don't want to do that. You don't want that. You have two instruments who are lovely in their low registers as well. So you have, have to find solutions in the form of the piece, not only timbral solutions, like structural solutions. So how this will be coming and going, how you will just, uh, let's say, envelop the, the timbre of the instruments and the orchestra in different ways. And then you started doing the, oh, it's okay, we will, we will, we will, solve this. We don't need it now because as I'm talking, if there can be a solution found, no, don't worry, no worries. I can, I can talk for three hours. Don't worry. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so what happens with Salto di Sappho, because it's also this idea that Sappho is, you know, is jumping from the big white uh, uh, cliff abyss in Lefkada, the white island, let's put it that way, it's called Lefkadas, and the myth says that she jumps for that and commits suicide because she um, you know, was in love with somebody. Um, a very passionate kind of action. But if you are there, I only see pictures of this specific location, uh, which is called uh, Salto di Safo or Lefkadas in Greek. Uh, it's just like a magic place. You're on the top of the, of the, of the sea, of the Ionian, and then you see all around you it's sea, it's, it's, it makes you crazy. It, uh, I can imagine that people are jumping because they're getting crazy also as well there. And there are some people who really jump. Uh, we don't know about stuff, it's, all, it's just a myth. But, um, uh, uh, and there was also a temple of Apollo there and things like that. So it, it, is, it, is, a, it is a place. It is a place that uh, asks for, um, that, that, I don't know, like, like uh, it, makes, it makes you, um, come to an ecstasy only if you are there, I think. I've never been there, but I, I've seen pictures and I got that feeling even from the pictures. And my uh, um, relation with this place is that when I left to go and visit Louis Andreessen and to leave uh, Greece forever, let's put it that way, because in this quest for music, sometimes you have to say goodbye to the places where you come from, unfortunately. But on the other hand, I am somebody who is seeking for new things. So yeah, it was a part of my nature to leave. Um, and you all come for different spots here. I mean, you come here also as well to learn and perhaps you don't go back home or you go, I mean, we understand that. Uh, like artistic emigration, it's, it's very ancient, let's put it that way. We, I know, I've read also that in the medieval times, the artists were walking all Europe with the, carrying their artworks <laughs> and, and, and um, uh, in an exposition about uh, a medieval uh, Dutch painter and all that stuff. So, I mean, we know for artists what it means to travel. So the boat, uh, because I went with the boat and then with the train to uh, Avignon, I was following also courses with Messiaen and Boulez and all that stuff. And then I moved to Amsterdam with the train again to meet Louis. And on the way to do that, in the night I've seen this light and this light was coming from this, uh, um, um, let's say, what's the name of it? This uh, rock, this big rock there. And, um, I imagined that this was the spot where Sappho jumped. Um, and I imagined that I also, in a way, was jumping in the darkness because I didn't know what I would go, what I would do, how things would come up in my life, or would, uh, would, uh, leaving all these things behind. It was not easy. And then I wrote this piece about, you know, imagining um, in the form of it, like huge curves of going down and then up again. And in this, I put the registers of the uh, recorder and the, and the pan flute on the low registers, then getting them to the high and all, and I created a kind of waveform. But in this waveform, it was very clear that it was a floating form, what I named floating form. That means that there were lots of ways to create it and there was a lot of inserts to put. And after all, you choose for um, one spot that your piece stands at, the, at its best, let's put it that way. It could have been also different, and perhaps it wouldn't have made any 
big difference. I mean, in the following orders or in the inserts. But for that specific moment, after all these months and months of leaving it unformed and creating material that you know where it comes, after all, then it starts stabilizing itself. It's like also very, very, uh, like like you see, uh, I don't know, let's say a mirage, something in the air, something that it gets clearer and clearer, like a projection that is very vague at the beginning and then it becomes more and more clear and after all you can see what it is about. But perhaps in this uh, time that you wait, it also forms in a different way. It certainly does. So waiting is also very important in this way of composing. Having strong nerves also because you never finish it. You never say every day, oh, I have made the four minutes, five minutes of my piece, I am going further. I am in schedule, I'm not stressed. No, you're stressed because the piece is not ready at all. Nothing is, it, 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 it's not proceeding. It also goes on like this. You don't know this is the end, this is the beginning. Perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. And you don't know even what material is going to come in between. So things are quite um, nervous breaking as a process, but it gives to me and to my music this elasticity that I'm seeking for, this, this life, this breath, this... Uh, um, uh, let's say, um, yeah, as I said, elasticity is for me very important. That it's not stiff. It's not like I am only this, I, uh, but I am moving. And then through also the performance, it's moving even more because you know it becomes like more and more um, blown up with the breath of the musicians, the sound, the air, everything. And I want to have that. I, so I'm not like saying all the time. Um, you have to play only this, and I'm not controlling, I'm not over notating, you, you will see also my score. Because I want to have um, the musicians um, coming with their own life, filling in this floating form that I created. Salto to Suffer was really freaking, beca freaky, because until the end, until like quite a long time from the deadline, I decided, because uh, I, I was interested in creating movement in this form, because I chose for this kind of firmus idea, because then you have harmonic points, uh, in a longer phrase, let's put it that way, even in the whole piece, something like that. And then um, I inserted uh, moving uh, elements, like float, uh, move, uh, more dynamic movements of strings or let's say shorter notes, waves or whatever. And I'm saying all these things because these are the, some of these elements I have used in Odysseus. Odysseus is not 17 minutes of Salto Sappho, it is one and a half hour. This is, um, it, it was meant to be one hour, but it's because of this elasticity I'm talking about. It uh, stretched half an hour extra, can you imagine that? And it was really, also for me, quite weird to see that this te what this technique brings, but also we had to call for that, because that the premiere was at the November Music and it's a festival, so they were planning like strictly what will happen after my premiere and other, I mean, I endangered my own, my own piece that was coming after that. And, um, but it is very rewarding as a result because um, then we talk about music which is alive and um, in a way cannot be controlled even if we would like to control it. And we think too much of control because we are composers and we do control it. But I still think that the music also should just talk by itself. Just do something outside of us and bring us together. So um, this is the philosophy behind it. Talking about the big uh, rock <laughs> in the middle of the sea in Greece, I met my friend and wonderful artist, Agoiska van der Molen. With her we worked together on Odysseus. She did the projections and the image and I did the music. Um, for the first time I just met her in the opening of a very amazing book of Rem Kolhas, the architect. And he presented his book. It's a huge book. It's called Elements of Architecture, very inspiring. And it was like a huge event I found it in Amsterdam. I thought this was the most hip, hype event I could ever, you know, be there, even better than a premiere. Well, how can I say it? But I thought of it. And then um, she came, of course. And um, I told her, I, I met you through other common friends. And I told her about Salto di Sapo, and she just takes her mobile, and she said, she says to me, look at that. And that was that one. 
I don't know if I have it on the right. <laughs> My voice kind of is looking now from the streaming. I'm sorry if this is not the right. Perhaps it is like that, but it doesn't really make any difference. You know, it, it's not about having the right. Perhaps it's like that. Perhaps it's like that. Certainly, it's not like that. So when I saw this, this is this is this is a rock uh, a, a, on Greek on Greek ground, um, and when I saw it, I don't know, I almost you know I really thought this incorporates exactly all whatever I wanted to say, not only in Salto di Savo, but something so deep in me that this will have a continuation. It's not it's not um, uh, finishing here. It's just the beginning. <laughs> and uh, so um, now I'm going to tell you more about Odysseus, how, how, how this started. So this was just like one very important moment from the beginning of, for the beginning of Odysseus. Um, so let's put it aside and go now to the narrative of how I thought of it and what happened. And we don't have any. And we can, we can, okay. Yeah, yeah, so we will do it. Um, um, concentrate. I have written two more pieces on Greek archetypes, at least, uh, not on the South of Isabel, but um, I, I'm very much inspired by Greek mythology, not because I'm Greek. I mean, you know how many inter people all over the world and through all the ages and historical era eras, they are inspired by Greek myths because they are very transparent and you can put a lot of yourself in these myths. I mean, I think, I think this must be the secret and they are so... Um, well imagined and they have so much space and so much space for our imagination and for our interpretation I think it's a way of, of, of all of these archetypes so um, it's like they embody all the human nature like every there is a, a name and each archetype for all these characteristics of our psyche or our mind of our desires of different characters that we have or different uh, situations we can we can be in and um, so I uh, have written two more pieces uh, on Greek archetypes. The one is Medea, the first one, uh, written for the MIA ensemble, but they don't, uh, they don't exist anymore. They, they transform to maze ensemble now, which are a lot with electronics. And um, um, I was asked to do something on the term of melodrama, and then of course I thought, yeah, the most melodramatic thing I can imagine is Callas not singing. So in this film of Pasolini, like there is no, I can't imagine another melodrama more, uh, you know, like really shocking than that. So I thought, and I love this film, and I also have a lot to do with the personality of, of Callas, because of course, being Greek, she um, is one of the examples of women artists uh, that you can, you know, when you're young and you have, there were not so many women composers to reflect to when I was wanted to be a composer in Greece. Um, and then Callas was, of course, one personality that you could uh, be inspired by. And not only that, uh, of course, Greece, we all still have our contemporary myths, and Callas and Onassis, they are a myth in Greece still. So why I'm talking about this? Because I decided to do Medea as the first of one of these pieces that are dealing with an archetype, a very theatrical one, uh, very dramatic, but no extra elements and only music are um, are uh, presented in the pieces. So Medea has no um, videos or no, uh, you know, extra musical elements. It's only the music. And uh, I wanted to, and only chamber music, so no orchestra, no big scene, no lots of musicians, not uh, huge amounts of money that need to be given, to, uh, spent to make this. You can make it at home, you can make it in a room, you have eight musicians, you can bring them there, just please just turn some lights off and just listen, you know, and that's it. Um, so uh, this piece was half an hour and it was like a self-portrait of mine, but not, because, not because of Medea's story, but because of, um, no, no, not in this way, right? What we interpret, oh yeah, she kills her children, jealousy, whatever. No, no, no. It's about <clears throat> about gaining power. It's about it's an energy thing that I was interested in this story, and also with Carlos not singing uh, was amazing in the film. So I was very much inspired by it. But at the same time, Medea is non-narrative as well. So there is not any narration in there to follow. It's about a situation 
that you're coming in, musically speaking, as, as an audience, and me too, and that musicians are being transformed to Medea, to, you know, kind of f theory uh, things for the violin, not the recorder, there was violin recorder, trombone, electric guitar, piano, um, percussion, um, I don't remember, was it also double bass, probably, yeah, of course, double bass, I don't remember, well, sorry, eight instruments, no singing, nothing. So that was the first piece, and I call it the upgrade of chamber music, <laughs> because uh, yeah, I mean we can have huge, uh, you, we can we can create huge, let's say um, dramatic um, events, and also emotionally very charged with less instruments. It's not a problem, and they don't need to be sonatas and all the stuff again. I mean you can create like uh, operas only for three instruments without singers even, which are not operas anymore. They're like. Um, operas from inside out. They have an, another more uh, intimate and more, let's say, even hidden kind of dramatic dramatism and, dram and dramaturgy that comes out when you listen to it and it comes in the air and everybody gets another interpretation or another, gets another, put himself or herself differently into it and gets another stimulation. And that's all a part of it of the game, that's all a part of the magic, let's put it that way. So I did that, and then I did Narcissus, yes, that's also another archetype. This grew up to an hour, it, it was for six instruments, and then um, it's because um, I said I don't want any extra musical um, me, uh, uh, what's that, media, mediums, uh, except the ones that are necessary, that, that, that from the beginning, they are a part of the creation of this. So for Narcissus, Narcissus was, um, from the beginning, the, uh, my wish to include scents, because I am myself, uh, as we say, a fume head. That means that you are going and smelling in the shops all the time perfumes, and you know how they're made, and you cannot control yourself, you go more and more and more, and um, yeah, that's a part of your, um, uh, it's an obsession that gives you a lot of um, energy. And uh, I don't know, it, has, it, it is something that you have or you have not, because uh, the smell is just a very important um, uh, sense. And it also goes back to our, um, let's say, we are out of control when we are smelling. We cannot control our reactions. This is just like genetically for us. It's like anatomically, it's like the way we are. You cannot control your uh, reactions to a, to a smell because you have been connecting the smell with a specific emotion, a specific situation that you smelled it. And this will always be there. And it will always be recalled when you smell something that you recognize. Uh, for each one of us, it's different. So, for example, there was a rose perfume that could be nice. And then if you have it on, the other person will come, oh, you made me feel my grandmother, please don't wear it again. Uh, or, oh my God, it makes me think of the grandma my vacation, or it makes me think of this, or you, know, you get like, I don't know how many reactions that are not coordinated anymore, because everyone has a different data bus of these, of, of these reactions. And of course there are some general things, like um, there are perfumes who could react in different way with our emotions, and I played with this in this piece. Um, it's called also Narcissus, a play for music ascent. I composed it for um, an ensemble that's called New Amsterdam's Pale, NAP, and a -E in Amsterdam. Uh, the two uh, heroic musicians are <laughs> the pianist Gerard Bauhaus and Helene Hulst, uh, violin. They are soloists, they are also together, and um, like married. And um, they have this ensemble, they, they do very special projects, and they were very open for this. Uh, piece. Um, I thought of it as a kind of double concerto, so the dramaturgy in this is a kind of double concerto idea, so because there's always a musical idea in it. And then w we and my friend Tanya Durlo, the syntax pair, we made a counterpoint, talking about counterpoint, uh, in with scents, with building up a specific scent as the composition is, is developed. The composition has two let's say, main points. The one is the piano world, so it's Narcissus 
uh, uh, being, let's say, uh, the very beautiful, young uh, person, irresistible, also cruel because he was re rejecting everybody, uh, running around the lakes and, <laughs> and um, na in the nature, and it was it's very mystic, also very sensual in a way. So there is another kind of scent. Um, uh, let's say, uh, note there. And then we built up all these notes and we came to the heart of it, which was a very complex, um, uh, more complex Narcissus flower smell. And then on the long run, uh, we, we brought also um, scent that was burned because it was kind of more ritualistic. Because Narcissus just, with, when the violin uh, timber comes more dom becomes more dominant in the whole of the piece because it's about piano dominating timber with the alter egos, the friends of the piano, which were horn and harp. And then we had the violin main, like dominating timber of this, which was like a violin, cello, and bass clarinet. So I, did, I, I made it like this. Of course, there are tutis and everything. And so we, co we go from a kind of more diffuse idiom to kind of more monophonic also, and then we burn also incense, kind of um, specific incense that uh, Tania, um, you know, included in her composition. And at the end, when Narcissus is being really transformed to this flower, because that's what it is, after all, he dies in the myth and they, there is this flower growing in his place. And it's, very, it's a very paganistic idea. And then at the end, you can smell all the, the whole perfume because it's in the hall and it's being built up during the piece. So at the end, you have and the chord of the Narcissus in the piano, the musical chord, um, uh, which is very signed, like the sign of Narcissus. And you can smell all the built up perfume. So, and then it remains in the air. So that was the idea of Narcissus. So this is the, the second piece that I wrote, which there is an archetype, but no singers, nothing, only musicians. And the musicians become the heroes, the, uh, the archetype. Not only one of them, because then it's too narrative, if you see what I mean. And now we go to the series. How much time do we still have? Half an hour. Half an hour. I'm gonna... But how long is the talk now? Yes, because we have to... I'm going to be very quick about the Odysseus because mm -hmm. I didn't think that I would talk about Medina Narcissus so long, but I think it's good for, for um, it's good because it's a part of Odysseus as well. This idea of upgrading chamber music to something operatic, something big, I mean, this is what, what it is. And these two pieces are very important as development for Odysseus because Odysseus is a piece without text, based on text, based on the epos. It's an epic story. And there's no narration, there's no actor, no singer, there's no text to read, nothing. You have, uh, I don't know how many musicians have, nine? I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm composing a lot and I forget my instrumentations. Uh, nine musicians. And they are all creating um, a soundscape, creating a situation which Odysseus is. Reading Odyssea, I read it, let's say, not only from before uh, when I, st I was studying at school, but for this specific piece, I think I read it three or four times, having the translation and the ancient Greek text, because I can read ancient Greek, but I need also the translation, but I understand very well the structure of, this, of, the, of the sentences and everything. So what I did is I studied uh, the um, let's say the narration techniques of Odyssey. And if I will put it very quickly, I'm not a philologist, I'm just a composer and I'm using these things to structure my music. So what I found out is that we have narrations in narrations all the time. You never hear like, oh, Odysseus did this. Oh, Odysseus did that. No, you hear immediately all the time uh, different persons from Odyssey talking about what he did. They seek him. They try to find him. Telemachus goes and meets Menelaus and the other uh, 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 king to find out where um, Odysseus is. Uh, we get stories from all around about what happened, also from Ilias. We get to know that we don't know if he's alive or not. Or the last time we saw him, he was there, blah, blah, all these things. And then all the time, even in the realm of the dead, they talk about him, the dead. 
the living talk about this, what his adventures, and they don't know what he did, and the gods. So we have three levels of storytelling, and stories in stories, which are um, also non-linear. <laughs> so there is something about storytelling that is non-linear that is very attractive. Um, of course, to make such a piece, one hour long, that was the idea, without having any narration, without, um, let's say that you commit to the adventure that Odysseus also committed himself to. So the hero, like your technique of Kaposi becomes what the hero did, like losing track of orientation, uh, traveling all the time, not knowing where to go, where to go, or whatever was happening, like the, the, the journey just always was deviating by unexpected factors. Um, it's about also the desire, actually, perhaps not to go home after all, because he did his best not to arrive. All the choices he did was like created more and more problems. Um, I also found out that is that is a soulless creature, Odysseus. It's, it's not. It's not a living being. I mean, it's not. It's not like. It's not like an, an, um, that you talk about uh, a person that has had a life. Odysseus did not actually have a life. It's like a myth in itself, but not like Narcissus with his stories and all this stuff. It, it was like very something very empty, very cosmic. Very. It's, it was something more about moving, movement, um, than um, drama or this kind of things. So these things were very complicated. The more I realized how complicated it was, the more um, I also, well, I didn't panic, but I didn't feel very comfortable about this choice that I had made to make this huge piece based on nothingness in a way. So um, nothingness because I didn't want to make a narrative piece, as I said. Just why would I write an Odysseus going from the Cyclops to the Circe to, and then creating sounds. I mean, this, this, this would be for me a ridiculous choice because I'm not like that. Um, I'm not saying it, it's ridiculous if you take it seriously to make it like this because storytelling is wonderful, whatever you do. Um, but not for me, not that, that thing. So um, I started creating um, material. I also studied how many repetitions were coming in, uh, like repeating words, for example. Like you have in this storytelling of Bomber sentences that work as frames to start a new, a new story, a new day. So when the, let's say the down is arriving, it's always like the rose finger down is coming over. And then you know that a new something will happen, could be dreadful. You hope perhaps he will go back, but he doesn't go back, these kind of things. You, don't, you never know what will happen when this rose fingered down is coming. Uh, this, this total uh, loss of orientation was very inspiring for me, also for the piece. Um, also the, uh, yeah, the idea of repetitions, creating frames, also musically speaking, for something that you don't know how it will develop. Um, so in a way I had empty hands. I had really empty hands, structurally speaking, from what I know how to make it, I couldn't really refer to a piece that I knew or um, I, couldn't, I couldn't actually find a steady bottom anywhere. So, um, but I had all these things in mind, of course, the repetitions, the sounds uh, that, he that are described by Homer. The sounds are amazingly described. If you see, if you read it carefully, it's like you see a, a 3D film. I mean, I've nev I think I've never seen a film as spectacular as in this description as these descriptions are. Perhaps also because when you don't see you make it even more, or perhaps because we know all these very spectacular films, and then if you put them now in your imagination, you see Homer in a different way, of course. But I would say see some epic films with lots of effects and then go and read it and then it's another it's another story um, than if you don't have these images in your mind. So it's all about how we make connections, of course. And then I thought this, this is very important. For this piece, it's the connections we will make as we listen to it, this will make it also. It is also very important to say that in this upgrade of chamber music, I do, I do not want to have conductors mostly. 
And for this piece, I composed it for no conductor and it may not never be played with a conductor because um, the musicians are creating the storytelling, this abstract storytelling, it's not even a storytelling. They create the events, the situations that we are coming in um, on the spot. What that means? It means that um, I have structures that are quite, let's say, uh, notated and they are measured and everything, but there are also situations where they are not measured. Uh, in this way, I extended this elasticity that I, um, I want to have, uh, and I leave it to the musicians. So I give away my time, I don't know if you follow me, I give away my control of time, but not my control of a proportion. So the analogies cannot be altered of all these things that I have composed. But the time can. How? Um, it's very simple. It's very, very simple. Um, I thought of the role of the musicians very well, because they are the conductors. They are the Odysseus, they are all the monsters, they are all, they are the sea, they are uh, the, the, the witches, they are the animals, they are uh, the nymphs, they, they are everything in, in the whole of Odysseus uh, adventure. Um, in order to do that, of course, uh, you have to characterize your material and your musicians very well. So I'm going to partly say, like, for me, it was very important that the sound that I have already said um, could, would be very clear in my mind. And this sound was something that I also freaked out about, that I had this, because I'm not a person who has these affinities with Tibetan bowls and, and ringing and meditation. And I, I'm not very much a meditative character. I'm, very, I'm more kind of active. I don't know what to say. Perhaps I am and I don't know. But when I had this... Um, Sound was a metal cosmic sound that this would be for the sales. That this is the sound I want to focus on. And what is the sound? Then I discovered, yeah, that um, you have the, the masters of the singing, singing bowls, and it's, it's an amazing, uh, they are amazing personalities. They create the sound, they create the vibrations and everything around. So I wanted to give to the percussion player uh, the role of the god. First, I thought. He would be, it's a he, uh, very, an amazing brass player called Joy. Um, uh, what's his last name? Anyhow, we will find out his names. Um, I hope he's not seeing, <laughs> mixing up names now. An amazing percussion player that plays with Asko. And I knew I could base the piece on food when I, I was having these ideas. But I didn't expect for myself not to create rhythmic. Uh, um, things for him. So he is the wing, he is, if you remember, there are the three realms that I was talking about of the storytelling, the realm of the gods, the realm of the living, and the dead, the realm of the dead. And he was definitely on the god uh, section, on the god realm. He could intervene and change, um, for example, the events. So you would think, I go this way, and then with him and his intervention, um, things are going the other way around. It can be a way of uh, the wind takes us in a mild way forward, or it can be only this, uh, bringing, bringing um, let's say, obstacles and changing the flow of events. So these things are happening in, 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 in Odysseus with him. He is mostly, ha he's having no rhythmic, uh, let's say, membrane kind of uh, instruments. He's playing singing bowls, gongs, and all vibrating um, uh, instruments. Uh, no vibraphone, for example. I was dreaming of using the hand pan, but we agreed with him not to do the hand pan because it could bring too many associations because he didn't have a hand pan. And because uh, it would be a happy coincidence, he didn't have it because with the gongs, the sound was more abstract. I have a fragment to show you on that. So um, the other instruments are the piano is creating, of course, waves of sound, waves of uh, uh, going up and down, like uh, um, 
moving and energy you could uh, translate it as a kind of sea sea waves or whatever but it's like a, a lot of unrest can be brought also by the piano and then um, we have the other instruments that are having uh, moments of homophony together or creating this kind of uh, st structures that are concrete uh, that are appearing and I gave them also names the piece, the whole of the piece are, is, consists of um, um, some elements that I have named because for me they were symbolizing something and it was very important to play with these materials in order to play with the memory of us when we were listening and in order to distribute them and understand how to distribute them in one hour scale uh, this needs control and, and I also need there a bit of narrative factor, please. I mean, you know, it's not abstract music after all. No, it's not. You will see when you hear it. It's not abstract, uh, but it's also not concrete. There is um, the, the Dutch writer called Edzard Mick, who happens to be my, my husband and he has been living with this stress for uh, the last year. And he said, this is hyper-concretism. It's like it's so concrete, also the image or a voice car and my music, that becomes abstract when you look at it because you look at it so close, you just go through it and then you go on the other side. So something very concrete becomes very abstract. And that's perhaps the only way I can say um, uh, about Odysseus. Um, so I will go and talk a bit more more detail about the composition because we need some more details before we listen to it. Um, I can show you the score, uh, but I, I prefer that you just, you know, see it privately. I don't want to show scores on the computer. It doesn't make any sense. It's a one and a half hour piece. What would show on the score? So I think everybody can navigate because it's about navigation and check out all um, of the things on the score in your way. I have to. Then I don't have myself, I don't have myself, but it doesn't matter. So you can see yourself uh, what I did with the three moments, how I structured them. Um, there are moments for the percussion that are, uh, for example, resonating and I create a kind of accelerando, decelerando movement, which I also thought it's very naive to do, but I really like it, so I did it. So it's like to 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 and then again going up. But this creates an amazing resonance when it is played on these metal, uh, metal uh, uh, instruments. And even if um, it has something naive, the naivety is a part of composing because if we were very smart, we would do something else. I don't know if you agree. <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> so let's go now for the... And I have also something very, very um, spectacular. I have my manuscript, not all of it, but I have some pages of my manuscript here. Uh, they are not very well ordered because it's not about order, this piece, but about disorder, ordered disorder. If by any chance, you want to see processes of working here, but please don't lose any pace. Although they're photocopied, the one really, really uh, manuscript is this one that I use only to put it in. You can see that I am putting dates in my manuscripts. It's because I would get totally lost because I'm making the same material for months, uh, creating it all over and all over again. So now I will tell you about the method and. Um, you will see that in this manuscript I put dates uh, that I composed it because next day I could go again, expand the same material or work on the same material. And then I need to know which day it was because the more I proceed, the more I get lost in all these inserts and developments that are not linear. So in order not to get lost to this, you have to order yourself very well. I mean, you need a lot of order, let's put it that way. Um, so by putting dates, you remember that this is older than the other one, so um, you can still mix them, but you still know what you're doing, otherwise you lose control of your own material. So date, uh, uh, giving dates of where, what composed when is very important. Who 
So these are some notes that I made for uh, that we don't lose it uh, totally the the, lecture, the form of the lecture. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not lose the form of the lecture. I'm losing it already. Anyhow, um, I made this kind of materials that I named, as I said, because this would be orientation points in the piece of the uh, in the in the small hour. And these orientation points had I gave them names after all. And I created, for example. A kind of um, melodic uh, segment that for me was forming a musical cross. Why a cross? Not because it's a religious thing only, but it's because I read somewhere that, um, I mean, cross it could be also a constellation on the air or something like that. I don't know. I, I didn't see a cross constellation. Perhaps there is one. I don't know. But um, I was imagining it as a, as, as you could have a constellation and to orientate your you know, sailing to nowhere and that you would like to see where you are, you could see that this is the constellation cross. Of course, it's all fantasy. Um, and musically speaking, I thought it would work the same. So if I would bring this melodic segment, which is which I never transposed, by the way, because I wanted to have it always recognizable on the steady point, on the steadiness of it, not in the steadiness. So not in, in fluctuating. So no transposing of that. It's a bit of a serial technique. So it was, there are some intervals that are crossing each other. I will show it to you in, the, in my script. Um, and I thought every time this comes will be recognizable. So I will play with this. And because I also read that uh, Odysseus journey had a kind of form of, a, of, a, of an X form because he went back and forth also to spots like Skilla and Harvey, he went there twice, back and forth, and then, um, so that, that made me think of, okay, let's make a cross also musically speaking. <coughs> then there is this idea, the rising star, which is, resembles the, um, let's say the, 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 the sentence of the down that is coming up, the rose finger down. So it's also very recognizable. It imitates uh, a kind of uh, harmonic, uh, like the harmonics uh, building up, like the octave and the fifth, but then goes a bit, with, it's, it's a fiction. It's not really, it's not spectral at all, but it plays with this rising thing, no, rising, star rising, harmonics, you know, whatever, sounds. It's not harmonics, it's all, all normal sounds. Then I have created a kind of a bit lamenting thing that's called high song, because or song of songs, you know, it's like a bit of, lamentation, something emotional, but you don't know why. I created uh, this, what I said, the accelerations and decelerations that are called uh, pendulum, because the pendulum goes up and down quickly and then slower. And I wanted to make a bit of a magic idea in this. And so I created poetic terms for musical material. Um, and then I was also naming, um, in the process of composing some moments, I gave them names. I gave them Fata Morgana, Mirage, drifting away, and you can see it all in the score. Uh, Aeolian soundscapes and Aeolian songs for the percussion player. Um, uh, I will show you here. So this is the first page ever. Uh, 
Yeah, you can say like it was the I started composing in November, but of course I had ideas before. But this is just the first attempt to really go on with them. And um, here you can see the creation of all these elements that I talked about. This at the beginning, this little thing with the A and G sharp, it's only two notes going up and down. It's very important because it's all about going half note up and down. It's a bit uh, also of, um, let's say, um, that like the movement of the sea, uh, of the boat, like going this and this. It's in there, but it's also very lamenting if you put it, uh, if you hear it. Um, this kind of, I didn't want to play piano, but I will play that one. Percussion sound. So these things were clear even in November, but it took it took a whole year to be crystallized. Well, okay, three quarters of a year. So uh, these were elements that were for me very important. music with that <laughs> but with structuring things you really go far um, let's see if I also have you know you remember these techniques of formula things like um, that Stockhausen was explaining but he was meticulously developing this formula idea it's 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 actually um, like the micrography of what you're doing, like it's a chart. This is the first chart of Odysseus. You can see in my manuscript that I developed it um, uh, elasti elastically speaking, let's say. Um, how I proceeded with this work, it's complicated to say because it's a piece about going nowhere and returning from nowhere. So there are two parts, after all, um, the journey and the return. By these materials, that the, it's the beginning of composing, let's say, a um, situation where I could put them in, but also creating a whole chronological layer of Odysseus. So I composed it also chronologically on purpose. So I created, let me put it in this way, things that were structured and then I operated on them and composed more sharply other events that are more direct on the top of them. So this has a kind of continuation, you can imagine that, but it can also lose continuation and that's the non-linear process. I mean, so it means that I took this and I was starting putting things in there. You can see it in the other days as well. This is stage one. 
here, you can already see it from the page two. You can see there are possibilities for having here kind of accompaniments. Um, this is here uh, the, the cross idea that I had. These are the intervals that I was talking about. And this is an attempt to put them together. And then you see, I say, I write here, and after you can put this, and then you have this, and this, this can come inside, and then this, and then that, and then the pendulum, and then the cross could come in, and then, and then, and then, and then. So these charts are developed by me, all the time structuring them clearer and clearer and clearer, until it comes to the form that you see in the, in the score, developed like this. Uh, um, by operating sharply, it means that you create also moments that are more dynamic. Uh, the, move me, the movement and the arpeggios were very important because they would give kind of direction, so I put them also, I, I inserted them in on a different state, state of uh, writing. I also did that until the last moment I was changing orders. And then I compose also little chorals. Like, I also like the word choral, but choral from the sea as well, I'm, I'm playing with these things. Um, and these were structured moments, like a choral in a way, with, with uh, different voicings, but not to, too complicated, but you could recognize them also very well and very immediately. And I thought I would work with them more, but they come very, very clear at the end as in the form of islands, because the idea is that we lose all the time ground. We have a journey that leads us to the song of Eolos. It leads us to the middle of nowhere. Just before uh, you can see it in the score, it's called Drifting Away. So we start with um, getting lost <laughs> in the journey. Um, this moment of the drifting away has also a second idea of uh, Odysseus going to the underworld. It's very mystic, very soft. I think I reflect Timbrell speaking to the Coptic Light of Elman, which is one of my most beloved pieces that I ever, like, I really admire this piece. There are some timbers that you can think like, oh, perhaps I know it, could be because of that. And um, so in all this fictive going to nowhere, there are wind moments, there are storm moments, there are rising stars, there's high song coming in and out, all these things that I named, they're coming in and out. Um, not in a following order that you expect. They are uh, tore apart as far as I could tear them apart, bring them, up, bring them apart. This is the power of, the, let's say, the sailing, the sea, like you lose dimension. You don't know anymore what the dimension mm -hmm. is. So I was very much interested in this, losing orientation, tearing apart material until, until how far you can tear it apart that you still recognize it. Uh, as an audience, it's not psychoacoustic. It's really like it. It's technically like you do it. You you augment materials so that you don't. You see, like how long can a melody be? It's not, and yet that you will still recognize it. For example, these are techniques that are inspired by early polyphony because you have a, the, the tenor and the other little voice in organ, for example, like doo -doo 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 going in, and then you have the tenor, and the tenor is a well-known. Uh, uh, melody of Gregorian chant, for example, but these are very inspiring techniques if you want to work with melodies. Also, iso isorhythmic things, like how and how, and then uh, to make them irregular, or these are techniques that are really also probably used here, because I also want to control the resonance. So I don't, I don't want to have uh, by chance resonances coming in and out. I want to control, I want to know in which resonance I'm composing and what this does to the material I put, because that's the consequence of working with no vertical harmony, so you have to control your resonances very, very well. You have to know, I'm in G sharp and Y, and what that does mean with the rest of the piece. And then you can, you can create more, let's say, uh, colored uh, resonances than if you don't hear it and you're by chance in G sharp and you stay there without knowing and then you don't know what you're doing. So it's, it's actually about not knowing where to go, but knowing what you're doing in order to achieve that. <laughs> and then, uh, then, so the journey, then it finishes there in the Song of Eolos. There are two of them even. And then uh, the return. I, really, I, like, I like very much the title, the return. It's about going back and not never going back. So in the return, the, you, can see, you can say like there are two parts with the same material. They even begin, begin almost the same. And then, 
it is differently, the energy of the return is very different. There is more, I find more um, dynamic movement in the return. Um, it's also because I have put there a kind of, um, yeah, let's say more um, of these are of these uh, piano moments with the percussion and lots of uh, yeah dynamic gestures there, and um, it's also I, because I wanted to put at the end the total disorientation of the event. So all these chora, cho little chorals that I have composed that you can see them in my manuscript, all of them together, they are like nine pages, pages full of these of these chorals. But I thought I would put them all. At the beginning, I thought that these nine pages that you see there in the manuscript uh, photocopies, that this would be the series. Can you imagine that? I thought that this would be the piece from the beginning to the end. And it, they just came at the end, at the return, tore apart like shadows, like total shadows. And at the end, it is very choral-like. Uh, also the chords, they're, they're coming, there are chords coming where it's not always, I, I changed my techniques from homophony to, um, let's say, yeah, lots of drones, lots of lots of resonances. I changed it with lots of uh, micro micro uh, harmonic structures that are happening. Uh, also, solistic moments, um, very characteristic uh, evocations of trombone or clarinet or violin, and. In there, I put a lot of dramatization on the foot of them because they transform to what you would have expected to have from Odysseus, a nymph, a monster, um, a beautiful creature of the sea, whatever. They transform to that because they even come out of, of the sea, I mean, of the musical sea, of something, of a gesture that pushes them out. These are things that are done also in Salto di Sappho, like how you push, musically speaking, and you really, um, uh, what's the name of it, anavio, it's in Greek, that you uh, reveal a material from another material, but come, coming very dynamically out of it. And then when you do this, it sounds like you've never heard before, because it's all a manipulation of how you're doing it. Um, this is the procedure of making it. I don't know if I forgot something. Perhaps it could be interesting to have some questions before we go on to, to listen. Look, it's, it's such a process that it's very difficult to talk a bit about it in such a short time, but I can tell you I said a lot. So, some questions? Yes, please. Yeah, thanks for this question. And I'm, I'm quite interested in researching in uh, co-creational processes. And so I was wondering whether by Non-linear, and also when you mentioned the, the role of the percussionist having the role of like changing the wind of gods and changing the direction of music, whether this was open to like the, the will of the percussionist himself, or if it's everything scored in your it is scored when this will happen. Okay, uh, as you see. Yeah. So yes, I have made my um, uh, orientation orientation points of the piece. Yeah. They are steady. Yeah. Uh, because it's not about interaction, it's about expansion. I see, yeah. Uh, it's not an interactive piece after yeah. all. Well, it, it is interactive in the way that you have to know it and to react on the events and to create it on the spot yeah. because there's no conductor doing it for you yeah. as a musician and this is also the fun of, that, of it. Yeah. So you are responsible for your own tempi, for your own articulations, for how you bring it in, your own dramatization, so there's no freedom of that. But the following order is decided by me because I am sure that it would yeah, you know, it be different. Beautiful. Well, it is another, it can be also another idea, like I'm doing new music for dance, yeah. And we decided to do it differently. Like I put modules, like uh, like I would put the sort of choral one, choral two, yeah. choral three, and then they would have to bring them themselves in, or the choreographer, or the, even a conductor would come and say, "Now uh, choral one, now uh, storm one, and now you know yeah. these kind of things." But it's not about that dynamic. It's more about the poet, the poetry of letting go of time yeah. and the expansion of it. So these pendulums. This uh, that I that I put them in the percussion player and the piano mostly, also accelerando and the are part of 
for the game as well because it's very epic, you know, so to go for it, to go for accelerating, running. Uh, it, it's the adrenaline kind of sound, the heart yeah, going faster and then going back. Um, but also the resonance. And these moments are elastic in a way. Everything is elastic because if the proportions are there, they can play them longer, they can play them shorter. The tempos are not like, oh, you have to play on tempo, you see. So in this way, the material is made in such a way that it does not lo uh, lose uh, identity and structure if you are operating on it that way. So the percussion player say long, please play long these uh, um, pendulum moments of your, take time for the soundscapes. The soundscape can be a long one. If the percussion player decides to do it five minutes, I mean, it can happen. No questions. Was I so clear? <laughs> Perhaps uh, we should then uh, go and listen to some fragments, huh? And it was uh, very complicated to find fragments. I took me like, and uh, I got, I got quite uh, miserable. I felt miserable and depressed when I was, I was doing it yesterday, finding the fragments, <laughs> because it's impossible to cut it up, to cut it down. I, all the things I wanted to share with you, and then we will have to have an one and a half hour of seeing it. But there is a link of uh, the registration for you if you're interested after here to go in your, on your own and, um, and listen to it. I will give us the registration that November Music has put lots of more performance so you can also check some other performance uh, of that. But for now, we are going for the beginning. <laughs> I um, I didn't show you the pictures from the performance. I have some very beautiful photographs also to show. It's also important because the visual aspect, I forgot, I didn't say that the visual aspect was also disorientating. So I voiced Governor Moller with her assistant. They were um, navigating on her images during the performance in a way that you were losing also orientation of what you were looking at. You could think you see water, you see the rock. She also used another image with water. And see, uh, she also made a total disorientating, non-narrative and non-linear kind of um, uh, journey in her own uh, picture. That was it. And these were pictures, photos from the performance. You can see the percussion, Joy Marais, that's the name of the percussion player. The clarinet player is uh, David Quecksilber, and the uh, trombone player is uh, Kuhn. And they are wonderful musicians of the Asko Semberg Ensemble, all of them. Um, you can see. So you can see the projection was big behind the musicians. The percussion was on the one side and the piano on the other for the resonance. Yeah, that was the setup. And now, Odysseus from the beginning. You know what, I, I have a problem now because I have my points, in my points of orientation I have the moment, so I have to check it out here. Uh, okay, we will listen until the eighth minute and then we will put uh, another in.
We stop here because we can't listen to it all. <laughs> um, so this is the beginning and you see some events and some everything. Do we finish? You want to stay? No, eh? So go, go again. <laughs> okay. Yes, now we go to the minute 22. There are some more uh, aeolic moments there. And uh, you can see the percussion player. Let me do that. And then we just go uh, to the other part. To the, this is from the, the journey still. It's the first part. So we go. Okay, I just put it from here.
this is much better when somebody sees it live or have a dark space and better sound but you got an idea of what was happening with this guy <laughs> he has made the setup himself uh, he's really a very theatri theatrical um, he didn't spend a even a time with me he just did it you know just he read the score and he filled in his own it's like an actor like an actor also sees the script and fills it in with his her own personality their own personality and then that's what he did and that's what I really think for me for my music it works what musicians are doing this like filling in the notes like it's a script of a theater play and then you do whatever you need to make it alive so now I think we should go to the second part uh, and finish everybody can also go if they don't have time I would like to show you the the ending the return starts again the same with timpani going like making this epic kind of brrr and uh, accelerating and it even gets worse than the beginning than the first part but uh, I want to go from bars 9391 um, this is uh, so I will put it from here and you will see the islands and the mirage and a kind of monster ugly and monstrous moment so you can see lots of things and at the and the end and um, it's a bit long but we don't need you can walk away if you don't want or you can ask questions but I'm gonna leave it until the end so I'm starting one hour 13 minutes and it's bar 391 for the ones who have scores Let's see if I can put it on the 13. Ooh. Okay.
but you have seen also one of the more, uh, let's say, active moments. <laughs> um, it's impossible to solve the interaction of the percussion player very well because it just spawns half an hour you need to um, get into it. So perhaps it's a wise idea to ask questions. And Lee Lee does a background at the beginning, so we have A, B, A for, for this lecture. So, okay. Why do I like these sounds? <laughs> I, I'm also composing much more jazz, but I'm also composing like with balls. Well, as I said, I created materials out of these um, melodic fragments that I named. Huh? So the cross has a very specific, uh, you heard it on the violin on one moment that comes very softly in a very, in a very high note, you heard it actually, it was the cross. Da -di -da -di. This, yeah like contrary motion kind of thing, meeting in one point. Um, uh, the materials that I have used are quite clear to recognize and to as associate with. Um, let's say I use lots of homophonic things, so of course octaves. Um, I also use fifths on purpose and they are parallel because I thought it was the most monstrous I could ever imagine. The ugliest movement I could ever imagine is that, so I put it there. I move it up and down because it's in the motive of the high uh, song and I said that I move this half da up, up and down minor second in order to create um, disorientation because you don't know what, which tonal center you are because you go up and down. Uh, so these are the main reasons. The material is clear and recognizable. And one more answer is that I actually uh, don't like very complicated harmonies in my music myself. I mean, I can do it if I want. And if I will find another concept for me that I can explore the more and more complicated harmonies of the world, perhaps I would do it. I don't want them gray, so I will always keep them clear. I like colors in the music, musical terms. So colors means clear materials that you can identify and they color the structure and the timbers and everything you're doing. This piece has to do with resonance, so of course the more open um, the intervals are, the more resonance you get. And the rising star, of course, it starts with the octave and the fifth and then it goes its own way. Uh, well, yeah, this, uh, it's semi also the decisions for this Odysseus, but it's also me. I have, in all my composing years, then I have came to the fact that these are the sonorities that I really work with. Yeah. Other question? It's playing, but we don't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's the muted on this earth. Okay, that's the next piece. Another question? Yes. You are, what, th this is a wonderful question. I have exactly the same problem. Um, yes, I also had this problem because I, I studied in Greece piano and my uh, associations were stress, uh, being terrorized by the teachers, being, uh, you know, like uh, almost, <laughs> let's say, uh, harassed, not harassed, what's the name of it? Uh, like they treated you like, uh, you know, like, oh, uh, you have to practice, you have to study. You, I had one teacher that helped me, Reitanos, what's his name? But uh, anyhow, it is a contradiction, like uh, spending five hours a day uh, playing the piano, and knowing all this material and all these pieces, the pianistic pieces, that they have also their own 
uh, let's say they cannot, cannot, they are canonized and they are important. They are, well, and then you know, as a composer, you have a double problem here because you already think like, oh my god, these composers, and oh my god, these piano pieces. So it makes it even more difficult to go for the piano. But in the long run, I, uh, I, I, um, I, I, I got, I got rid of this, and I started doing my own things as I always did, improvising and I wrote some piano pieces, and I think I will, I want to focus more on piano writing. I did Narcissus, you know, this double concerto violin a piano, where I put a lot of my own things. I, I, I composed kind of breakthrough piece that's called Piano Forte, a long time ago again, uh, where I had to understand what I'm doing on the piano, and I used the MIDI to uh, improvise quickly and get my materials from this and then to work with this note. So I got my materials by playing them, but I couldn't get, I couldn't understand what I was doing. So then I saw it in the finale, you know. I, I don't do this, but it's just a method. It, it, these are all methods in order to get something that you need on that specific moment. So I thought, yeah, you're doing these things, you don't know what they are, but just play them and see what you get. Uh, and then I proceeded in a very crazy piece, actually. A very, 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 very weird also, very weird stuff. Uh, weird in a way that they're octaves all the time, octavating ha heavy metal kind of thing, and then Cooper and ideas, and then I don't know. But that's how I got rid of it. Just went for it, you know. Yeah. So we are finished. We can have a drink. Okay. Well, you don't hear the beautiful mirage at the end, but it looks, it looks like a mirage this way. <laughs> it's the best way to finish it. Thank you so much for coming here in the morning and listening to all these crazy stories and adventures and uh, composition on non-linear processes. And um, so we can talk after I I'm hanging around. So.